Today on BRTV Investigates, it's time to find out, does zero TDS really mean zero contaminants? Hi, I'm Ryan, your host of BRS TV Investigates, a weekly YouTube series which explores popular reefing theories, products, methods, what the manuals are missing, with a focus on putting them to the test, and then give away some of the stuff we test at the end. This week, we're going to start with taking a deeper look into RODI system performance. So a vast majority of long-term reefers are using RODI water at this point because for most of us, there's simply no way of knowing what's in our tap water and we want to eliminate obvious contaminant concerns like phosphate, ammonia, and nitrate, as well as the accumulation of other potentially harmful contaminants over many years. An RODI system is designed to remove virtually all of the contaminants and most of us are using TDS meters to measure the system performance. Zero TDS representing near contaminant free water appropriate for a starting point with mixing fresh salt water and replacing ongoing evaporated water. Zero TDS is really about two things, the filters and DI resin that's going to achieve that and the tool that we're going to measure it with. So today we're going to focus on three things, share a brief overview of how DI resin and TDS meters actually work, then show you how these systems perform at removing a variety of contaminants from our tap water like disinfectants, ammonia, silica, and phosphate, then take a quick look into how a variety of TDS meters performed at measuring these things. For those of you that are a bit newer to this, the reverse osmosis system and membrane in particular is going to remove a vast majority of contaminants from the water, often upwards of 98% of them. Well, 98% is an average. Every potential contaminant is different, and it might only reduce half of the things that you actually care about, like ammonia. This is why we use a cartridge of DI resin after the RO membrane. The DI resin is going to remove a vast majority of the remaining contaminants and result in zero TDS water. Explaining what's going on inside the resin and how that's achieved can be somewhat complex, but the simplest way to explain it is there are two types of resin beads inside this mixed bed resin cartridge. If you look closely, you can see these colored resin beads in our most popular color changing resin with one golden brown bead and one blue. In this case, the golden brown resin is a strong acid cation resin and captures positively charged ions like ammonia, iron, and sodium. These blue resin beads are referred to as strong base anion resins and captures negatively charged ions like silica, phosphate, nitrate, and chlorides. Once we mix the two beads together, they will capture a vast majority of the contaminants which have either a positive or negative charge in the water. You may have noticed a clarification I keep making, which is the resin only removes electrically charged contaminants. Some elements or compounds can have either weak or no electrical charge. In this case, the DI resin is not going to remove these things efficiently because there's no electrical draw to the bead. Now, part of the reason that we mix the two resin types together rather than run them separately is to utilize the sheer quantity of reactions between the two resins and the millions of reaction sites to promote some of the compounds to change form into something that does have a charge and is removable by the resin. Related to that, the way that almost everyone measures their water purity at home is with a TDS meter, which is designed to tell you TDS, or total dissolved solids in the water, silica, phosphate, nitrate, sodium, and other contaminants, all representing a dissolved solid. I will note the TDS meter isn't designed to be perfect. It just gets really, really close. That's because a TDS meter doesn't actually measure dissolved solids like the name suggests. It measures the electrical conductivity of the water, which is a pretty solid estimate of the amount of dissolved solids that are in the water. The only true method of measuring dissolved solids is to evaporate all the water out and weigh what's left, which is not something that any of us will ever do. The reason this works is because pure water is actually a very poor conductor of electrical conductivity. Electrical conductivity generally goes up when there's more dissolved solids in the water. Higher the dissolved solids, the higher the electrical conductivity the TDS meter can read. There are two primary types of meters that use this method for measuring water quality, an EC or electrical conductivity meter, or the much more popular TDS meter. However, they're measuring the exact same thing. The only difference is the number that pops up on the display. All a TDS meter does is apply some math to the internal EC or conductivity measurement to display a TDS reading. Most of the popular TDS meters in the RODI industry use pretty simple math to do that with, and TDS is basically half of the conductivity measurement. So if your EC meter reads 100, a TDS meter will display that as 50 TDS, which is half of the conductivity reading. 
There are some exceptions to that rule, and some meters use slightly different math or conversion factors, because this is an imperfect science. Fact is, TDS is a generic term, and various dissolved solids have different electrical charges. For instance, the EC meter measures in something called USCM, or microsiemens per centimeter, but one part per million sodium chloride has an electrical conductivity of 2.04 microsiemens, and sodium bicarbonate has half that at only 1.06. So unless you know the exact contaminant in your water and use that particular conversion factor, this is always going to be a ballpark number. So many applications use different math or conversion factors based on what they're actually testing. Most meters designed for RO or DI systems seem to use sodium chloride as a reference, which basically halves the conductivity measurement to get TDS. This is likely because sodium is one of the more common elements to be able to make its way through either of these types of filters. Most of the sodium is removed, but of the things that break through, sodium is often referenced as one of the more common. So why use an EC over a TDS meter? Well, not many people will. However, if you want to just use raw data and skip the conversion formulas, this is a way to do that. With the right meter, it's also potentially a way to start looking at fractions of a TDS, or even less than one, in that search for ever purer water. However, I'd be careful with that thought process, because water won't stay that pure for more than a few minutes, and it will pull TDS from the air, or really anything that it touches. One of the quickest additions is the result of CO2 or carbon dioxide in the surrounding air, which rapidly reacts with water, and will increase the EC or TDS over a very short period of time. Small amounts of CO2 is not something that most reefers would care about in their water, but it does interfere with reading near zero TDS numbers. For a vast majority of reefers, I would suggest using a TDS meter, and just know this isn't an exact science, but well within the requirements most reefers will have for their reef tanks. That said, we use an EC option here with the Hawk meter for all of our experiments because it's the most accurate representation of water quality. We do record the Hawk TDS, which uses a nonlinear calculation for TDS, particularly at the lowest ranges. Some of you may have already picked up on one potential issue with all this. The contaminants which don't have an electrical charge, or even a weak one, can pass through the DI resin in small amounts. On top of that, the TDS or EC meters may not read them because they don't have an electrical charge. Meaning elements like free ammonia, which don't have a charge, can make it through the filters and not be measured by the TDS meter as well. So there's a decent amount of debate about this within the reefing community, with people often sharing that you may need specialized filters or testing methods for elements like silica. So that's what much of today's testing is all about. How many of those unknowns are going into our tanks with a standard RODI system? I can tell you right now that if you're getting zero TDS, the vast majority of you are using awesome water and shouldn't get hung up on any of this. So for today's experiment and the second component of today's topic, we looked at a few different types of source water, Minneapolis city tap water, reverse osmosis alone, deionized water alone, and finally RODI water, which is a combination of those two filtration technologies. We measured pH, TDS, ammonia, total and free chlorine, nitrate, phosphate, and silica removal on all the various filtration technologies. Minneapolis water just happens to have pretty significant amounts of all of these undesirable contaminants. So starting with our baseline of Minneapolis tap water, which today has a pH of 9.41, for this portion we're going to measure the TDS using an HM Digital DM2 inline household TDS meter, which read 122 TDS. 122 is absolutely on the low end, and most cities or wells will be much higher than that, which might give you the perception that the general contaminants are low, which isn't necessarily the case. It's what the TDS is comprised of. Using the Hawk DR3900, we used specific tests to get a bit closer view into that. Starting with total chlorine, we had 2.89 parts per million and 0.4 parts per million free chlorine. In Minneapolis, a majority of the total chlorine is chloramines, which is chlorine reacted with ammonia. So we also measured 0.72 parts per million ammonia in the city tap water. Followed with 2.3 parts per million nitrate, 0.53 parts per million phosphate, and 10.1 parts per million silica. All of this ranges from deadly to pretty undesirable for a reef tank and much higher than we would like to use as a starting point for a brand new tank or making fresh salt water for water changes or continual addition via evaporation replacement. Overall, a pretty solid example of why reefers use RODI to begin with.
I'm going to start with RO water as the first filtration element to look at because it will be the worst performance and only reduce most of the contaminants by 95 to 99 percent, starting out with a pH of 10.07 and a TDS reading of 8, which is higher than you might expect, and we do have a likely cause for that that we'll get to in a moment. While both free and total chlorine are zero, ammonia is still at 0.32 parts per million and pretty high, nitrate at 0.02, phosphate at zero, and silica at 1.5 parts per million. So overall, the pre-filters in RO membrane was able to remove a vast majority of the elements that we were concerned about. However, I would caution not to expect this in every case, and there are a lot of factors which can heavily impact performance, particularly pH can have a major impact on the specific forms or compounds that these elements take on. Some are much easier to remove than others. For instance, the membrane was only able to remove around half of the ammonia, and there's a distinct reason for that. Ammonia exists in two forms. Under a pH of around eight, almost all the ammonia exists at NH4+, called ammonium or ionized ammonia, which Dow states is readily rejected by the membrane. However, above a pH of about 10, almost all the ammonia is NH3, which is ammonia as dissolved gas and often referred to as free ammonia, which Dow clearly states will not be rejected by the RO membrane. Since our city tap water has a pH of 9.41, it's safe to assume a vast majority of the ammonia will be in that dissolved gas NH3 free ammonia form which passes straight through the membrane. The 0.32 parts per million ammonia in our RO product water does seem to confirm that. Sadly, to make matters worse, the free ammonia related to that high pH will actually cause the pores in the RO membrane to swell, which will result in a lower rejection rate and passing additional dissolved solids through the thin RO membrane. So the 8 TDS in our product water actually makes sense and very likely due to the presence of free ammonia in our water swelling the membrane's pores. Now most of the ammonia is actually the result of the chloramines in our water, which is chlorine reacted with ammonia. When the carbon blocks split that bond, there is some residual ammonia as part of that reaction. Even with carbon blocks like these, which are designed specifically for chloramines. There are some ways to more effectively deal with chloramines and the residual ammonia, but that's a really big topic and an entire video of its own that we'll cover in the very near future. So outside of ammonia, the Dow membrane actually performed really well in many of the things that reefers care about with nitrate at 0.02, phosphate at zero, and silica at 1.5 parts per million. Silica could be a bit better, but also likely the result of the ammonia-related pore swell. So let's take a look at what happens when you put a mixed bed deionization resin canister after the RO system, often referred to as RODI, and what almost all of us are using. The pH is now almost a perfect neutral at 6.95. TDS is zero, which should be expected. Zero total and free chlorine. 0.02 ammonia, which is at the lowest limit of the testing range accuracy for a testing procedure, but also could be a tiny amount of free dissolved chlorine gas, which doesn't have an electrical charge, so it made its way through. Even if it did have a charge, a standard TDS meter would never read two hundredths of a TDS like this. Nitrate came in at 0.01, phosphate 0, and silica at 0.013. All of these are ultra low readings. One or two hundredths of a part per million ammonia, nitrate, or silica just isn't going to be an issue for anyone. That said, one thing that we should keep in mind is the closer you get to zero, the harder it is to test for accurately. Something like 0.02 and zero should probably be treated fairly close to the same on many of these tests because it's within the accuracy window and testing limits for all of them. We're just going to report the results as found. So the zero TDS water is obviously suitable for using in a reef tank with near zero contaminants, but before we move on, let's take a look at how DI resin performs on its own, meaning we just saw how DI resin works when it's dealing with a feed water of 8 TDS RO water, but what if we pump 122 TDS tap water right into the resin at 400 milliliters a minute, which is at the same rate as the RO system? Well, we get a pH of 6.46 with the same zero TDS product water, zero free and total chlorine, 0.3 parts per million ammonia, 0.01 nitrate, zero phosphate, and 0.14 silica, which is almost the exact same as being fed with RO water. So the mixed bed resin is really able to achieve the same type of results all on its own. Some of you might ask why we don't just use only DI resin. Well, that's mostly because DI resin isn't cheap, and reducing the TDS with an RO system first can cut down on the consumption of resin by a magnitude of 10, 20, or potentially many more times. It just wouldn't make a lot of financial sense for most people to go DI only. 
In addition to that, remember that DI resin only removes contaminants which have an electrical charge and there are a lot of other things in the water which the carbon blocks and RO membrane remove, like potentially herbicides, pesticides, disinfection byproducts, various chemicals, or other contaminants. Lastly, DI resin doesn't treat all contaminants equally. For instance, strong acid cation resin will remove a wide variety of elements, including ammonia and hardness like calcium and magnesium. However, the resin has a strong preference for hardness like calcium and magnesium because of their stronger electrical charge and will release elements like ammonia which have a weak charge in favor of these hardness elements. This means it will essentially be a band of concentrated ammonia moving towards the top of the DI canister as it depletes, and ammonia will likely be one of the first cations to dump as it hits total depletion. So in general, it's a good idea to change your resin before you hit 100% depletion, and also a component of why DI resin is often treated as the final polish rather than the primary filter. So moving on to that third part of today's topic and looking at the various TDS meters for each of these tests, we actually measure TDS and EC with four different tools. First, our Hawk meter which tells us both EC and TDS as well as pH. Second, the HM Digital DM2 as well as the HM Digital DM2 EC which measures electrical conductivity directly without the conversion to TDS. And the COM100 which is HM Digital's pen type meter which measures in both TDS and EC. I'll also note the COM100 measures to a tenth of a point which represents a closer window into those lower TDS readings. So again, looking at the tap water, I'll start with the Hawks TDS of 105.8, an EC of 222, the DM2 TDS of 122, and the DM2 EC of 241. And the COM100 TDS of 147, an EC of 221. So you can see there are some variations here, most significantly with the COM100, both in terms of against the others, as well as itself between TDS and EC, because the EC should be around double the TDS. So here's the thing with the pens, they're way more susceptible to user error and accidental contamination. I often find I can take multiple readings from different areas of the same sample and get different numbers. Even in this case, just removing the pen and changing the reading from TDS to EC, we got a significantly different reading. This is why the inline versions like the DM2 and DM2 EC are much more popular. There's a very limited chance for any contamination, atmospheric or otherwise, while the water's still inside the tube and flowing consistently over the probe sensors. With the Hawk sensors, we normally use a 1,000 milliliter glass beaker and flow water to the bottom of the beaker with the probes above it, and then allow it to turn over for 30 minutes before taking a measurement. After reading those, the COM100 measurement is taken in the same beaker. Looking at RO only, which is much lower, the Hawk TDS is 7 and EC 14.07. The DM2 ATDS and the DM2 EC 16 microsiemens. The COM100 TDS 9.8 and the COM100 EC 15.7. All pretty close to each other. Looking at the DI only, Hawk TDS is 0, EC 0 0.12, the DM2 and DM2 EC both 0, the COM100 TDS 0 and the COM100 EC 0, so everything is reading the endpoint pretty accurately. And finally, the RODI, the Hawk TDS is 0, EC 0 0.11, DM2 and DM2 EC both 0, the COM100 TDS 0 and COM100's EC 0.1, so the only tool measuring any reading at all is the COM100 in EC mode. With the Hawk electrical conductivity readings, we're getting a 0.11 and 0.12 with both the DI and RODI applications, and it's as low as it gets. This is representative of ultra-pure water, which requires pretty expensive meter, like the Hawk laboratory meters, to even read. So a single canister of mixed bed color-changing DI resin does a pretty awesome job of polishing the water for our uses. So that wraps up today's episode. We don't want to give away a used RO system, so this week we're going to give away a brand new BRS RODI system. So click that link that just showed up up top, or head on over to the site, click on the sales and deals, and then free stuff to sign up. As always, if you like what we're doing here, give us a quick thumbs up and subscribe because we release new reefing videos all week long. See you next Friday with another episode of BRS TV Investigates.